Hello everybody, welcome to number 27, I'm Jack, and this is a Rover 75. This is the last car ever made before Rover went under. Now, there are many, many theories as to who was responsible for Rover's demise, from BMW, the government, Honda, to maybe saying, well, the 75 just wasn't good enough. I had given up trying to find a definitive answer to what went wrong, but in this video, I'm gonna outline the main theories and lastly, we're gonna take it out for a drive and find out, was it the car itself? Was it just not good enough? Right, so the first theory about what went wrong is that it was all down to the British government. Now, BMW, when they bought Rover, ended up investing about 2.5 billion, of which 800 million was the purchase price, but the rest, so 1.6 billion, something along those lines, they had invested into Rover. They were then incredibly miffed when they asked towards the end of the 90s, the British government to give them a subsidy of 200 million, and that didn't seem to be forthcoming. The Blair government dillied, dallied, initially offered 125 million, then they offered 150, but by that stage, things had already moved on. It was too late. Things had already moved on. All the negative press had really begun to hurt Rover as well. So could it be that it was all down to the British government? If only they'd given BMW a bit more money, maybe we wouldn't be in this situation today. The second approach, and one that I think is a bit more tenuous, but it is important to understand if you want to know what happened to Rover, is that it was actually Honda's fault. So in the 80s, Honda kind of helped Rover to survive, frankly. They let them use their designs, and some of the most successful cars, the 400 and 600, essentially were rebodied Hondas that used Honda technology. Once BMW had bought Rover, they insisted that obviously Rover kept on paying them royalties for the Honda technology that it was using. This meant that it was very, very difficult for Rover to make a profit. They didn't have enough volume to be able to sustain that kind of model. So enter BMW. Now, initially, they were hailed as the saviors of the British motor industry. It looked like a great match. Rover concentrated on making comfortable cars, BMW Sporty. They didn't have the off-road experience that Land Rover had. And at that point in the 90s, Ro Rover had had a little bit of a resurgence and was performing relatively well. But of course, part of the reason for that was it was getting support from Honda. Now, it would appear that BMW either didn't know or underestimated the cost of that support. For the 90s, until the 75 came out, they were reliant on some of that Honda technology for the cars that they were building. And those royalties really cut into the profits. BMW should definitely have been aware of that. Something else that people say is that BMW had never had any intention to hold on to Rover. They really just wanted the mini name and the technology that Land Rover had for off-road cars. I'm not sure how true that is, but it is quite interesting if you think about the Mini, that when the Mini started to be produced, this was still part of the BMW group, and yet they didn't use the K-Series for that car. They used a Chrysler unit. And some people say, there you go. You see, BMW never had any intention of sticking with Rover. And despite all their investment, there is definitely a big black mark against BMW, and it goes like this. At the beginning, it was all honey and milk and lovely, and they said, you know, they gave Rover lots of independence. They said they trusted them, that they had faith in them. By the time that this was launched in 98, uh, BMW had begun to lose patience. Obviously, there were problems, and they hadn't realized quite what they were buying in Rover. So, when this was coming out, there was quality problems, but also financially, I think with those Honda royalties going out, BMW realized that it was gonna be quite a while before they were gonna be able to replace the whole range and start making some money. Thus, they were pretty disgruntled and really unprofessionally burnt Pierce Streeter, who was the BMW boss, at the launch of the 75, gave a long rambling speech about how they were gonna to have to close Longbridge because the quality wasn't quite up to scratch. They're gonna to have to have mass redundancies. As a result of that, of airing that dirty laundry in, laundry, that dirty laundry in public, sales of Rovers plummeted 
making the situation even worse. Perhaps the 75 just really wasn't a very good car and that's why it didn't sell. Let's take it out. I'll tell you more about how it drives, the good, the slightly less good, and then we will try and decide just who was responsible. So the official launch at the NEC was a bit of a disaster because it took away attention from what was otherwise supposedly a good car. But when the journalists actually got hold of these, all the reviews were actually very positive, not just from the British press, but from the foreign press as well. So the 75 was judged to be a pretty good effort. Now this one is my own example and it was built I think in 2003 or 2004. It is judged that the earlier cars, while still under BMW ownership made in Cowley, were slightly better quality. There was something called Project Drive, which was when Rover was offloaded by BMW and the sort of private consortium, they went on a radical cost-cutting drive. But from the things that I've seen, it's stuff like that the the handbrake gator here is now plastic rather than lever as it, as it was originally. There are a few little sort of nuts and bolts that were changed, different sort of logos, all that kind of stuff. So there was definitely some cost cutting, but I've got some real gripes with stuff that I don't think was changed as part of that cost drive. Now, first of all, let me just say that I think the interior is a fabulous piece of design. It's got a little bit of that oldie worldy Rover feel. I love those dials. And so I think visually it's a real success. When you look at from, you know, when you look at it from a couple of meters away, when you first open the car, you think, wow, it's a great place to be in there. But when you actually start using the car a bit more, you find out some limitations. So for example, just opening and shutting the door, that does not feel like a nice quality sound. Then there's other things like these window switches. They look absolutely hideous. They're not nice to use and, you know, then they're not, they're sort of quite wibbly wobbly. They're not, they do not give you, this car has 85,000 miles and the driver's side one is super, super loose. There are other things, I mean, I could go on, but there's this, this little lip here, which looks very nice, but then you might sort of, I touched it just to see whether it pulled out or did anything like that. And there's nothing underneath. I don't think it's just this car but it's just, you can just feel the plastic ribs, the strengthening ribs, and that feels really, really cheap. There are examples everywhere of that. So looks amazing at first sight, but the quality doesn't quite seem to be there. There's other things like the Selector. This is a diesel car, it has the BMW engine. I imagine that the Selector is a BMW part, but somehow or other, it manages to feel really quite cheap and shoddy in this car. Um, I don't know how they manage that, but it's just, it doesn't have a nice action. And usually, at least on an auto gearbox, that is, you know, that usually it feels nice to be shifting, you know, into drive, not on this car. Admittedly, someone pointed out in my other video, you don't have to use it very much. You put it into drive and kind of forget about it, but it's just not a very good first impression. Now you will have noticed that I do have an auto, it's a diesel. I wanted a diesel, didn't necessarily want an auto, but the 75 is actually one car in which having an auto, even one of these old slush boxes, this is a five speed, it is a slush box, does dent performance and economy. But the standard cars had a plastic clutch slave cylinder, which is in the bell housing. So when they get to this age, if that goes with a lot of them, it's just scrap the car because you have to take the gearbox out to replace it. So can we attribute these quality issues to Rover? Well, to a degree we can, but I think it's also down to BMW. I know BMW wanted to keep the, project, the products very separate, but I really don't understand why they couldn't use exactly the same switch gear. Some of the stuff in here is shared. For example, I know the climate control system, I think is BMW, but the switch is on. And I don't get that. It would have cost less money. They would have been better quality. They would have looked better. And certainly VW doesn't seem to have suffered. Audi doesn't seem to have suffered by using the same kind of switch gear as VW. One theory is that Rover initially wanted to make it rear wheel drive, which of course would have been a lot more prestigious. BMW didn't agree. Whatever the truth of that is, you've got this transmission tunnel, which has hobbled interior space, which is a problem. And it's a problem also because they didn't want it competing with BMW products. And as a result, this wasn't really quite any solid segment, this car, because 
It's bigger than a 3 Series, smaller than a 5 Series, but because of the way it's been designed, the interior, I mentioned that transmission tunnel and so on, there really isn't that much interior space. So it's quite a hard car to place for buyers, or it was at the time. Now we go on to the looks. I personally, I don't get it, because I've always thought that these were very handsome cars. As I said, I think the interior, in terms of that it looks very good, I think the exterior as well, really quite a successful rehash of old British ideas. And Rover Bream Rover, that kind of junior Bentley, very junior Bentley, <laughs> approach, I think would have suited it really well. Um, so to me, the looks weren't a problem, but I understand if you read sort of some of the articles of the time that they weren't universally appreciated. Maybe you can tell me what you think, but I still believe these look good. They did a facelift in 94, I think, which to me absolutely ruined it. It's sort of, you get one single front light with a little a bit of a blob on it, and it wasn't an improvement at all. Okay, let's, we got the negatives out of the way. Let's talk about how it is otherwise as a car. I wanted something that I could waft around in, that would be comfortable, that would be quiet. And it fulfills those roles really, really well. Also, when you throw it around a little bit more, although it feels like quite a heavy car, this is a diesel, so it's even more front heavy, but it acquits itself pretty well. There's quite a lot of lean there. The steering, there's a bit of a delay off center in terms of when it wants to steer and when it doesn't. But if you take it for what it is, which is, a comfortable family car. It rides really, really well. It's quiet. It is very comfortable. The seats are pretty good. Everything's adjustable here and it worked pretty well. It had a good cross section of engines. It had a 1.8, I think it was a turbo petrol. It had a, a V6 and it had the BMW diesel, which came in two flavors, 115 horsepower and 130 horsepower like this one. So again, my one question mark really is about the steering, which doesn't feel that great. There's hardly any feel in there. It doesn't firm up during corners, but weirdly when you're on the motorway, it feels quite heavy off center. Could just be that this is an old car and maybe the tracking needs doing, I don't know. But I think ultimately these were definitely good cars. They do drive well. They do what they needed to do. There is that question about the interior space. So my leg, for example, it's always resting against the center tunnel, which isn't totally uncomfortable, but would like to have a little bit more room there. And generally it just, the cabin just feels a little bit cramped. So overall the 75 wasn't without its faults, but I think at the time with the cars that it was competing against, it was good enough to deserve to sell in higher numbers. I have to say that overall, having reviewed everything, I do think that the major responsibility for this failure was down to BMW. There's too many things. That infamous speech that the chairman of BMW gave when this was launched was just put the nail in the coffin. I think that they also underestimated how long it was gonna take to turn Rover around. And it's a real shame because they had made, I think, one of the best Rovers in decades. This is a good car. You know, don't get me wrong, it may be the quality of some of the switch gear isn't brilliant. But overall, it's a distinctive car, nice interior. It is very comfortable. And that is what you want from a Rover. Thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna do a follow-up video on my particular car. We're gonna have a look underneath, check out some of the other stuff, some of the bits I like and that I don't like that are particular to this vehicle. Uh, rather than 75s in general. So keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching and I really look forward to seeing you for the next video.